Between 1970 and 1998, Dr. Death killed at least 215 patients. I'm Felicia Huffman, and this is Macabre at Midnight. Mom's back with us. Hello. Yes, that's my thing. <laughs> Just call her Miss Sniffles today. Yeah. My nose is not happy. All right. So you would have been alive during this time. Granted, he was this guy that we're getting ready to talk about was active in uh, England. But do you remember hearing anything on the news uh, about a doctor death or a doctor who killed his patients? The only doctor I remember was Dr. Kavokian, who did the attempted, uh, the assisted suicides. That's the only doctor I can remember. Oh, well, that's, that's not who we'll be talking about because this guy didn't do it for, I suppose, uh, good reasons, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, he was just me. <laughs> Harold Shipman was born on January 14, 1946, the middle child of a working-class family. He went by Fred and, his, and was his mother's favorite child. Vera, his mother, was considered domineering, and she instilled in him a sense of superiority that tainted most of his relationships, leaving him in an isolated adolescence. When Vera was diagnosed with lung cancer, he willingly oversaw her care as she declined until... until she died on June 21st, 1963. He was fascinated by the positive effect that the morphine had on her. Devastated by her death, he wanted to go to medical school and attended, and attended Leeds University Medical School for two years. He failed the entrance exams the first time but before serving his hospital internship. He was still very much a loner, but he met his first wife, Primrose, at the age of 19, and they were married when she was 17 and five months pregnant with their child. By 1974, he had two children and joined a medical practice in Todd Morton, Yorkshire, where he thrived as a family doctor before becoming addicted to pethidine, a painkiller. He would forge prescriptions for large amounts of the drugs and, before, and was forced out of the practice when he was caught by his medical colleagues in 1975. That's when he entered a rehab program. At the inquiry, he received a fine and was convicted of forgery. A couple of years later, Shipman was accepted onto the staff at Donnybrook Medical Center in Hyde, where he ingratiated himself as a hardworking doctor who wanted to be trusted by patients and colleagues. Still, he did build a reputation for being arrogant. He stayed there for nearly two decades, and his actions only attracted a bit of attention from the other professionals. The local undertaker took notice that the patients of Dr. Shipman seemed to be dying at a high rate and had similar poses in death. Most were fully clothed and would usually be sitting up or reclined in a settee. He was worried enough that he approached Shipman about this, who reassured him that he should not be concerned. Later, a colleague, Dr. Susan Booth, found the similarity disturbing and let the coroner's office know, who then contacted the police. A covert investigation followed, but shipment was cleared, as his records were all in order. The inquiry did not reach out to the General Medical Council or check criminal records, which would have shown them his previous record. Later, a more thorough investigation found that Shipman had altered the records of his patients to corroborate their cause of death. Hiding behind his facade of a caring family doctor, it was nearly impossible to establish when he started to kill his patients, or exactly how many died at his hands. The fact that he denied all charges did nothing to help the authorities. The killing spree was only brought to an, to an end thanks to the determination of Angela Woodruff, the daughter of one of his victims. She refused to accept the explanations given for her mother's death. Kathleen Grundy, a wealthy and very active 81-year-old widow, was found dead in her home on June 24, 1998, after a visit by Shipman. Shipman told Woodruff that an autopsy wasn't needed, and Grundy was buried in accordance to her daughter's wishes. Woodruff was a lawyer, 
and had always taken care of her mother's affairs. So it was a bit of a surprise when she found out that another will existed, leaving most of her mother's estate to Dr. Shipman. Woodruff was convinced that it had been forged and that Shipman had killed her mother, forging the will to benefit from her passing. She contacted the police, where Detective Superintendent Bernard Postles quickly came to the same conclusion after looking at the evidence. They exhumed Grundy's body and a post-mortem revealed that she had died from an overdose of morphine administered within three hours of her death, which was exactly the same time when Shipman was, had visited her. They raided Shipman's house and obtained medical records, an odd collection of jewelry, and an old typewriter which proved to be what he had used to forge the will. From the medical records they seized, the police quickly noticed this, that case would extend further than one death and the priority was given to the deaths it would be most productive to look into. These were mainly the victims who had not been cremated and who had died after being visited at home by Shipman. On a large number of patients, Shipman had urged families to cremate their relatives. He would also stress that no other investigation into their deaths were needed, even when their relative died of causes that were previously unknown to the families. In situations when they did start questioning things, Shipman would provide computerized medical notes that corroborated his cause of death. The police established that Shipman would, most of the time, alter these medical notes right after he killed them to make sure that his account matched the historical records. What Shipman didn't think about was that with every alteration of the records, there was a time step made by the computer which enabled the police to figure out exactly which records had been changed. After an extensive investigation, which included several autopsies and exhumations, the police charged Shipman with 15 individual counts of murder on September 7, 1998, and one count of forgery. Shipman's trial started on October 5, 1999, at Preston Crown Court. Attempts by his attorneys to have Shipman tried and three phases, for example, cases with physical evidence, cases without, and then the Grundy case where the forgery differentiated it from all the others, as well as to have damning evidence relating to Shipman's fraudulent accumulation of morphine and other drugs were all thrown out, and the trial continued on for the 16 charges included in the original indictment. The prosecution worked to prove that Shipman had killed 15 patients because he enjoyed exercising control over life and death and dismissed any claims that he had been acting with compassion as not a single one of the victims was suffering from terminal illness. Woodruff was the first witness. Her determination to find out the truth and her, for and her forthcoming manner impressed the jury. All of the attempts by Shipman's defense to undermine her proved unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. The pathologist then led the court through all of the gruesome post-mortem findings where morphine toxicity was the cause of death most of the time. Then they looked at the fingerprint analysis of the forged will, which showed that Grundy had never handled the will, and her signature was dismissed through a handwriting expert as a forgery. A police computer analyst testified how Shipman had changed the computer records to add symptoms that his dead patients never had, and most of the time the changes were made within hours of their deaths. As the trial moved into the victims and the accounts of their relatives, the pattern of Shipman's actions became clearer. A lack of compassion, disregard for the relatives, and reluctance to attempt resuscitation were bad enough, but another fraud was brought to light. He would often pretend to call the emergency services when around attending relatives, then he'd cancel the call when the patient was found dead. Telephone records showed that no actual cause, calls were ever made. Finally, they released evidence of the drug hoarding. He would prescribe morphine to patients who didn't need it, over-prescribe to those who did, as well as proof of visits to the homes of the recently deceased to collect any drugs that hadn't been used in order to dispose of them. The haughty demeanor of Shipman didn't help his attorneys paint a picture of a dedicated healthcare professional. Despite their attempts, his sheer ar arrogance and the fact that he constantly changed his story when caught in lies did nothing to make the jury like him. Uh -huh. 
Following the judge's summation and a caution to the jury that nobody had actually seen Shipman kill any of his patients, the jury were sufficient, was sufficiently convinced by the testimonies and evidence, and they came back with a unanimous guilty verdict on all charges on January, January 31st, 2000. Shipman was given 15 life sentences for murder and, a four, and four years for the forgery, which he commuted to a whole life sentence, which removed any chance of parole. Shipman was incarcerated at Durham Prison. The idea that a doctor had been able to kill 15 patients sent a shudder through the medical community, but this was to prove insignificant in light of additional investigations that dove deeper into his, into his patient case history. Through the University of Leicester, Professor Richard Baker performed a clinical audit. He examined the number and pattern of the deaths in Shipman's practice and compared them to other practitioners. The audit discovered that the rates of death amongst Shipman's elder patients were significantly higher, clustered around certain times of the day, and that Shipman had been present in a disproportionately high number of cases. The audit estimated that he may have been responsible for the deaths of around 236 patients over a 24-year period. Another inquiry by High Court Judge Dame Janet Smith examined the records of 500 patients who had died while in the care of Shipman, and the 2,000-page report said that the likely number of those he had murdered was at least 218. This was only an estimate and not a precise calculation. It also speculated that Shipman had, may have been addicted to killing and was critical of police investigation procedures. He claimed that the lack of experience of the investigating officers resulted in missed opportunities to bring Shipman to justice earlier. It is possible that he took his first victim only months after he obtained his medical license as 67-year-old Margaret Thompson, who died in March 1971 while recovering from a stroke. The deaths that may have occurred before 1975 were never officially proven. Of those that were likely murdered by Shipman, they included both men and women and were aged between 47 and 93. Most of the time, he would inject them with a lethal dose of morphine and then sign a death certificate stating that they had died of natural causes. The actual reason for his killings is still unclear. Some say he may have been avenging the death of his mother, while others think he was practicing euthanasia and removing older people from the population who would have become a burden to the healthcare system. A third possibility was that he got some type of pleasure from the knowledge that, as a doctor, he had power over life and death with his patients, and killing was a, very, was a way to express that power. Despite the one forgery, financial gain does not appear to have been a big motive for him. No matter what the actual number was, or what his motives may have been, the sheer scale of his murderous activities meant that Shipman was shot from a patient killer to one of the most prolific serial killers in the world. He stayed at Durham Prison throughout these investigations, maintaining that he was innocent and was staunchly defended by his wife and family. He was transferred to Wakefield Prison in June 2003, which made it easier for his family to visit. On January 13, 2004, Shipman was found hanging in his cell at Wakefield. He had used his bed sheets and tied them to the window bars of his cell. There is still a bit of mystery as to where his remains are, with some saying his body is still at Sheffield Mord morgue, while others think his family has custody of his body, believing that he may have been murdered and wishing to delay his inter interment for more tests. While Shipman is dead and he is no longer causing harm to people, a big question remains. How? How did he manage to possibly kill over 200 people without raising suspicions? What's more is all of the patients had been healthy shortly before they encountered him. The fact that he took a the fact that he took advantage of the trust that his patients had in him made his crimes particularly odious. Your thoughts? <laughs> I don't even know where to begin. I mean, I know it was done in England and not saying that they're behind the times with us. I mean, I don't know. He could have practiced it here and gotten away with it. He was, I guess he was just that good. Uh, he was. I don't think he was that good. I just think he was that lucky. Well, All you've got to have is a few incompetent police officers. Well, this is true. 
And there's been plenty of cases we've done in the U.S. where incompetence in the police department is the reason why nobody got caught. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I honestly think that he he was more addicted to the fact that he knew he had the control over a person's life and death. Um, I think he got off on it just knowing that, you know, he had that control. Yeah. Um, and it's like, why did he, and which is the one forgery, it's like, why did he choose her to forge a will? And honestly, had he not forged the will, he probably wouldn't have been caught. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wonder if he wanted to be caught. If he was tired of killing, that some part of him was tired of killing, but he knew he couldn't stop unless he was Anything's caught. Anything's possible. The subconscious mind can be rather, um, what's what I'm looking for? Um, complex. Complex. It can be stronger than, you know, what we think it is. Uh, it can lead us in different paths. Trying to figure out which cat that was. <laughs> but yeah, honestly, if it hadn't have been for, was it Grundy? Grundy's daughter? Yeah. Is that the one that he got caught? Yeah. Uh, he would probably still be. I mean, I don't know how old the man was, but I mean, he would probably still be out there killing. Yep. I think so. And obviously, uh, his mother's death was what triggered it. Yeah. There was something about watching his mother die and seeing what morphine could do is what caused him to start doing it. Yeah. I th and it could have been, he just started it as like a, um, experiment. Yeah. Uh, just like a, a child would with any type of chemistry or whatever, just uh, to see how much it took to kill yeah. somebody. And then he got a taste for blood, so to speak. Yeah. And he was like, this is fun. Yeah. Yeah. You're getting to sit there and, you know, one moment a person's healthy and the next moment they're dying. At yeah. And sense. see, that's the thing is he did it on perfectly healthy people, even though one of his victims was 90 something years old. Yeah. They were all healthy. They didn't have any. Um, yeah, it would have made more sense if he would have targeted like terminal, terminally ill patients. Yeah, it, it would have. I mean, to me, it would have made more sense. He and but well, it's like no, they were terminally ill. But yeah, if he would have just, you know, instead of targeting healthy people and then posing the bodies, that didn't make sense to me either. Did he yeah. want the people just to think that they were like sitting there or and whatever? Just peacefully and just, passed away. Yeah. Undoubtedly. Unless he, I, I, that's, that's something that they just glazed over. Nobody tried to figure out. What, well, to be fair, he wasn't cooperative in any way, shape or form. What? He never would admit it, even though they had the typewriter that he wrote the will on. Um, <laughs> So he wrote out a completely new will. Yep. And signed her name. Yep. Okay. And she never touched it because there was no fingerprints of hers on it. Yeah. And I've signed enough papers to know normally a person will put a hand down on like the top of the paper while they're signing at the bottom. Or I, I do at least. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they just, they kind of just glazed over the posing thing. Um, and he didn't pose everybody, but there was at least two chances before that, that somebody came up as like, okay, something's odd here. And there was small investigations into it, but then they were like, nah, he's fine. He yeah. didn't do anything wrong because he had his paperwork in order and they didn't think to check time stamps and alterations of the paperwork and everything because they didn't really have a reason to at that time, I suppose. Yeah. But even still, I don't know. He had patients that died at a higher rate than any other doctor. But yeah, I think the two investigations into it that the cops explained away or he explained away, 
I think was actually kind of stupid. Like the judge said, there was police incompetence because he had so many patients dying at such a higher rate than any other doctor in the practice he was in. I don't see why they didn't see the importance of an, of diving deeper yeah. into that instead of just trusting his records at face value. Yeah. I would, and I'm not bashing on England by no means because they're more advanced in some ways than we are. But I mean, dealing with the doctors here, uh, I would have to say that that would have rang a big bell here or set off an alarm here, uh, with that many him. I mean, cause even just, he started killing right off the bat when he got into practice. But, I mean, he didn't wait. They believe so. Um, um, but anything before, prior to 1975, which is when he started working at the practice after he went to rehab and got fired from his other job because he got addicted to painkillers. Right. Prior to 75, they're not positive. They're more positive, though, after he started working at the family practice. Yeah. But, I mean, I mean, I don't know. But I would think, dealing with some of the doctors that I visited here, I would think if a new person comes in and then all of a sudden all their patients are just dropping dead, I have a feeling that, well, like where daddy goes, I have a feeling that Dave would be like, um, wait, something's not right. That's how one of the inquiries into him got started as one of his coworkers at the practice was like, "There, the, these people are dying too much. And that's where the police came in. Um, and they they talked to Shipman, I guess, and Shipman's like, well, I got all the paperwork here. They were sick. It's normal. <laughs> but no, it wasn't normal, and they should have dug a little deeper. Because I'm sorry, if I was a cop, it would have yeah. set off some bells. Yeah, I wouldn't have just been like, okay, he's got paperwork. I would made sure that paperwork was true. The paperwork can easily be forged. I mean, uh, there is, and I didn't realize that computers put a ta- time stamp on things. Uh, I guess when you go in there to log in or whatever, that, and that's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, but people that don't know that much about computers probably didn't realize that. And obviously he didn't. Yep. Or he would have probably just handwritten everything. And it kind of goes back to like the candy man, uh, with the Halloween episode, it still amazes me how some people continue claiming they're innocent after they've got undeniable evidence against them. Yeah. I mean, granted the candy man didn't have as strong evidence against him as this case, but he never admitted he did anything wrong yet. His paperwork had time steps to where he changed patient files shortly after the patient died. Yeah. And then all the morphine. Yeah. Um, and then the typewriter where he forged the will. That was the big one. Yeah. And I'm sorry. Um, if a family member of mine dies while their doctor is in the room with them. And he tells me, oh, it was of natural causes. And I know nothing was wrong with them. And then he, you know, not demands, but um, just says, oh, you don't need an autopsy, natural causes, all this. That's going to raise suspicions in me. I'm and then be start like, convincing um, you to cremate their body. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, no. Getting rid wrong. of evidence. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that he didn't try to resuscitate patients. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing. It's like. And I just wondered, because obviously some of the patients that died in his care were actually ill because uh, he would be the attending physician in like their final days yeah. where family was around because he would fake the phone calls yeah. to uh, places. Uh, I just wonder with those, if he actually gave them morphine or if he was just basically playing God as uh, being the attending physician because he knew he didn't have to. Uh, well, he should have, but he could choose not to do life-saving measures and all that stuff. Yeah, that's possible. Yeah, it amazes me with the arrogance of some people, how they just, like you said, they, they 
it, like in their mind, they, they've become God and they get to say, well, you live, you die. Yep. But, yeah. There's a lot of people in many different professions that get that big head. Yeah. Although I don't know that his was necessarily a big head. I think his was trauma based. Yeah. From his childhood yeah. and watching his mom die. And plus his mom had, uh, he was his mom's favorite and she had turned him into her basically. Yeah. This domineering, and hateful that's, woman. That's odd for a middle child. I Normally know. the middle child gets neglected. Yep. Um, I thought that was interesting too. Kind of almost like a normal dates. Um, oh, and what I didn't put in here is, well, he, he hung himself, uh-huh. but he did it at a specific time to make sure his wife got the most out of his pension. Okay. Uh, I don't remember the specifics, but had he killed himself shortly after he got arrested, she would have only gotten like um, $10,000 or something like that. I don't remember, but he waited. Um, and at the time he killed himself, his pension or whatever it was, uh, she would have gotten like double or triple that amount each year or something like that to live off of. Hmm. I mean, I suppose that's a nice thing to do to make sure your family's taken care of, despite the fact that you couldn't just be a decent doctor. <laughs> but I don't understand why that, because it was the money he basically retirement, so to speak, from being a doctor is the money he was his wife would be living off of why he was still getting that after killing over 200 patients <sighs> cuz i would have taken that away from him well it all i guess it would all depend on what type of plan it was if it was like an individual retirement account i don't think they could take that away if it was through his job then, yeah, to me, that should have been stopped when he was arrested. Um, I don't know their plans over there in England, so it's, it's yeah. hard to say. But, yeah, it would depend on the account. And, obviously, he had it set up to where he knew his family yeah. would be taken care of. Yeah. I think it's funny they have no clue what, <laughs> where his body is. Well, why, what, he spent, what, four years in prison? Did he just decide that I just can't handle it anymore? Well, no, he, they believe he timed his hanging to coincide to where his wife got the most out of his pension or whatever. Oh, okay. That's why he killed himself because, well, he was on, I think if I remember correctly, they had him on a suicide watch every now and then because he would get depressed and everything like that. But, uh, other inmates have said that during his, that, that it was well planned out because he knew better than to show signs of depression or whatever, because then he would be more closely watched and everything. He made sure to seem like a completely normal prisoner and everything and doing fine mentally. That way he had the privacy to do it. And there might've been something to where his wife came and visited and they were talking about uh, money and everything. But yeah, and I think it's funny that one of the theories behind where his body is, is that his family is holding it for tests, thinking he was murdered. I'm like, uh, like he hung himself. Oh, but that's been 16 years ago. How the, 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 it's even frozen is going yeah. to sh show signs of deterioration. I'm is sure it not? he's buried somewhere. They just don't want his family probably doesn't want people to know because yeah. he's so notorious or infamous yeah and they don't want people um desecrating i suppose his grave uh, uh i know this is bad of me to say but if he had no respect for the living and he a doctor then what should it matter how people treat his grave now that he's dead because he didn't care yeah but i know that's wrong and you know, whatever, but any more thoughts about Dr. Death? Not right off the bat. 
That's it for tonight. Check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Patreon. Stay spooky, everyone, and see you next time. 